knows what's going on. My name is John McGregor. I'm one of the team at the Sennheiser Sound Academy, uh, and you will uh, hopefully get a chance, and I hope you do, uh, to join me in a couple of days for some sessions that I will be doing. Um, but obviously, we are hosting uh, quite a few training sessions over the next few, however long it ends up being. Um, so first of all, I hope you are all healthy. I hope you are all staying happy. Uh, and to increase your happiness and to uh, make things better, we are going to be joined by Mr. Andrew Lillywhite in a second before I hand over to him. Um, there are some normal rules for, for how we like to run our, or how I like to run our um, webinar sessions. Um, I prefer to use um, the chat function for uh, questions and answers. However, um, seeing that there is two people today and I will be banning it, we will we will open the uh, the Q and A um, session as well. The reason the reason I do like to have the, the the chat function on is just because normally it's be me by myself. So feel free to stick your questions uh, at any time during the webinar. Andy will uh, have a look at them if he sees them, and if not, I will start reading them out to Andy at the end. If they're in the Q and A section and I know what I'm talking about, I will ask answer them for you. Uh, however, uh, yeah, I'm a studio guy, so R RF I do know quite a bit about, but I'm not, I'm not going to step on Mr. Lily White's toes because he is the expert. So without further ado, oh, and one final thing, uh, there will also be a poll at the end of the session just to let us know how we did uh, and ask you some questions about further training that we could do over the next few, uh, I hope, weeks not months. Um, but other than that, I shall hand over to Mr. Lillywhite and I shall, uh, yeah, I shall be quiet. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, and uh, thanks, John, for the introductions. Hopefully you, what you're seeing on the screen is what you're expecting. Uh, Radio Frequency is best practice in a nutshell. Um, so we've just got a one hour session, but I'm, I'm going to kick things off by, um, let's, let's see if this works, shall we? We'll try that for the next we session. Tried. Sorry, folks. There was a video, but you didn't get to see it. I think it's a bandwidth issue, to be honest, mate. Could be. Um, never mind. So we'll move on to uh, the, 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 the point of today's presentation. I've only got an hour, um, so we can't go into huge depth on uh, the subject of, well, RF in an hour. So we had to pick a few topics. Um, because it says on the screen there, what's so difficult about wireless? And if you've only got an hour to talk about that, you have to pick and choose what you're going to talk about. Um, there are many things that can break a wireless system. And the things I'm going to talk about today pretty much apply to any wireless system of any brand, um, uh, any make and model pretty much, well, as you'll see as we go through. Um, so I'm going to pick the top three things that come up when we talk about problems with wireless systems. And my top three are frequency choice, um, people choosing, inappro making inappropriate, should we say, frequency choices for various reasons. Uh, the next one on the list, very high on the list, actually, probably should have come first, uh, is coaxial cable. Spend thousands and thousands of pounds, dollars, whatever currency you like on wireless equipment. And then it's five pounds, euros, dollars worth of cable that makes it all go wrong. Um, and then the third one that comes up a lot is interference. And so we can talk quite a bit on that. Quite honestly, any of those three topics I could easily do a whole hour on. Um, but I haven't got time to do that today. So we're going to get all three into an hour. Um, so let's kick off with frequency choice. Now, as John Mayer mentioned, 
oh, didn't do an intro myself exactly, I suppose, but uh, um, I've been in this industry for, well, let's just say more than 30 years. And uh, most of that time I've been dealing with RF wireless. And um, the last 18 of those years has been working for Sennheiser. But uh, so I've done broadcast live events theatre before working for Sennheiser. And uh, so going back to frequency choice. Now, as, I said, as John said, I'm in the UK. And so this is going to have a bit of a UK slant, to say the least, this frequency choice element. But hopefully you'll get the picture, which is that this, there are elements of this which apply wherever you are in the world. Now, when I do this in front of a live audience in the UK, at this point, I can ask somebody to, to name a frequency band and that they can use for wireless microphones. And uh, I, I can pause for a second and expect, cheerfully expect that the answer will come channel 38. It doesn't usually take too long to get that answer, um, which is exactly what I'm expecting. Now, I get a bit of a uniquely British thing, channel 38. In a minute, I'll talk about what that means in terms of channel numbers. But for the uh, any UK audience members out there, let's just bear in mind that when we talk about channel 38 in, in the uh, European system of TV channel numbering, channel 38 is only 606.5 to 613.5 megahertz. It's not anything beginning with a six that your equipment can tune to. Channel 38 is only that bit. Uh, so it's a bit of a uniquely British slant on this bit because it's to do with the, uh, the shared UK wireless mic license that uh, gives people access to that band. Possibly worth mentioning on the subject of licensing. Um, unlike things like driving licenses, which are you know internationally recognized by and large, um, if you've got a wireless mic license from one country, it gives you absolutely zero rights anywhere else other than the country that it was issued by. There are no reciprocal agreements that I'm aware of um, between any states when it comes to wireless microphone licensing. So unfortunately, it does mean if you've got it, you have to get a license if from every territory that requires it that you want to use your equipment in. So. Channel 38, a bit unique to the UK. There are other countries where you can license it, but it is uh, that bit of spectrum there, 606.5 to 613.5, is internationally reserved for radio astronomy. Now, the rest of that UHF band that you see on the screen there, and apologies to uh, viewers in the US and Australia who will be looking at that and going, wow, you've got all that spectrum. Um, well, we do have most of it available in some places at the moment, but that's going to change. Um, but that's the UHF band uh, as it appears in most of Europe at the minute. Uh, in the UK, the digital terrestrial TV service is called Freeview. Uh, it'll have a different name in different countries, but digital terrestrial TV basically occupies the UHF spectrum from currently well, 470 to 790 or possibly 470 to 694, depending on where you are in the sale of the 700 megahertz band in your area. And of course, in the US, you've already lost that long since and also the 600 megahertz band. So, um, but here over in Europe at the moment, we've pretty much got the whole of 470 to 790 um, still kind of open more on that in a minute. Um, the 800 megahertz band there is full of mobile phone networks, but you'll see a little gap in the middle, which in our channel numbering system is channel 65, or broadly channel 65, it's known as the duplex gap. And uh, it is one of the bands you can use in the UK on that same shared license that gives you access to channel 38. So the duplex gap, the duplex gap so broadly centered on channel 65 um, is, uh, can we do that? There it is. Um, it's actually 823 to 832 megahertz and it's available across the whole of Europe. 823 to 832 megahertz. Uh, and it is very, very quiet. 
um, provided you stay between those two numbers, 823 to 832. If you stray above 832, if you wander into this bit here, you will come showtime, get interference because all the mobile devices that are in people's pockets will be transmitting in there. Unfortunately, when you're setting up, during sound check and installation phase when there aren't many people in the building it's nice and quiet so if you use a scan function you might find lots of lovely empty frequencies up there don't use them but if you stay between 823 and 832 all will be well as i say that's available you're wide so again coming back to a, a uk licensing perspective which will differ in other territories um, but here we are in the UK uh, where I'm sitting right now. We're governed by the Wireless Telegraphy Act and there are three basic mechanisms by which you can have access to spectrum, by which you're allowed to transmit. That's the important bit here. Um, you can, receiving is a whole different ball game, but when you want to transmit radio waves, there are, there are licensing regulations. And you can have some spectrum which is deregulated or license exempt. A lot of people like to say license free um, or unlicensed spectrum has become a, a, a word. Um, unlicensed always has connotations of doing something illegal in my in my, in, in my youth. That if you said somebody was operating without a license, they were operating illegally. So a bit confused message there. Um, but unregulated, no license required. You can have some VHF frequencies. There are still VHF frequencies between 173.8 and 175 megahertz that you can access. There's a bit of UHF spectrum again available across the whole of Europe uh, between 863 and 865 megahertz. That is license free, but it's license free for wireless audio devices. So we find all sorts of other things in there. We find um, baby monitors and walkie talkies and uh, all sorts of other devices in that band that do uh, wireless audio. We've also got the 2.4 gigahertz band, um, best known as Wi-Fi, of course, um, but also used for Bluetooth and Zigbee and a whole host of other unnamed technologies that may be bespoke to a particular manufacturer um, in there. The rightful owner, if you like, of the 2.4 gigahertz band is actually your microwave oven. The, uh, the ISM stands for Industrial, Scientific and Medical. And uh, it's, the band exists for non-communication purposes. So, um, so the microwave ovens operate in the 2.4 gigahertz band. And then fourth on our list there, we have 1.9 gigahertz DECT, D-E-C-T, Digital European Cordless Telephony. But then, of course, because it got adopted outside of Europe, it became Digital Enhanced Cordless Telephony. And there are flavors, variations of DECT, five different variations of DECT used around the world. So you can't, unfortunately, quite take one DECT device and use it anywhere in the world because there are different versions using slightly different versions of the spectrum, but uh, 1.9 gigahertz decked devices are license free uh, as long as they are decked technology, the correct version in, in, uh, in the correct state. So we can use, there are wireless microphone technology devices using all those different bands that we can get. Uh, as I said, in the UK, we have this thing called the Shared UK General Licence, which if you've got one of those means you've got the same rights as everybody else that's bought one of those. Uh, means you have to work it out between yourselves if you all turn up in the same hotel in different conference rooms, which I'm sure we'll all be doing again one day soon. Um, but just not at the minute. And that gives you access not just to one band. Most people in the UK who've got one of these still think of it as the Channel 38 license, um, which until March 2015, yes, March 2015, some five years ago, it was only a Channel 38 license. That was all it gave you access to, just 606.5 to 613.5. Um, but now it has, ever since March 2015, it has got these other two bands on it. 
uh, the duplex gap that I mentioned earlier, 823 to 832 megahertz. And uh, also a uh, third band, 1785 to 1805 megahertz. And that, those last two, uh, again, although you may have to get a different license in different countries, they are available across the whole of Europe. Um, but the you know, UK license, if you've got one, does not cover you anywhere except the UK. Uh, just to emphasize that. So the 823 and 832 meg band. Uh, is available Europe wide 1785 to 1805 available in quite a few countries beyond Europe I know it's available in us well most of it 1785 to 1800 I believe is available in Australia I think the thing here really is to emphasize you need to do your research uh, with your own authorities or wherever you're working to find out what the spectrum is available you may be pleasantly surprised to find that uh, there's more spectrum than you think And then the third mechanism in the UK, and again, there'll be similar mechanisms in other countries, um, is that we have access to the rest of the UHF spectrum that is used for digital terrestrial television on a coordinated basis. Um, so once you license a, a piece of spectrum here in the UK for a particular TV channel, other than 38, other than channel 38, um, at a particular location for a particular time, that your spectrum at that location and time and without that we wouldn't be able to run the the major events and the touring theatre world would 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 not operate and west the west end theatre couldn't operate because you can't fit enough channels into the shared license spectrum uh, so the interleaved spectrum sharing with digital terrestrial television and the channels they're not using in a particular location is how it's done um, and you can get that as a, a site specific fixed license for a year or two years if, if, if you if it's your local your site if you own it now the other little change is that of course it's not going to be 470 to 790 for much longer uh, in some of the european countries i know this has already changed in in uh, in the uk we've got till the end of may before the 700 megahertz band is cleared but in in past the end of May it'll actually be 470 to 694 megahertz that we have available and there's one other little one other band I should talk about um, very briefly which is this one 960 to 1164 um, there are various moves around the world to um, open up other spectrum bands so uh, in some parts of the world, they're looking at 1.4 gigahertz, um, for example. Um, but uh, here in the UK, the, uh, the regulator came up with this idea to uh, allow sharing in this band 960 to 1164, which is an interesting concept uh, because the primary user of that band is the Aeronautical Navigation Service. Now, the upside of that, if you could make it catch on around the world, would be because it's an aeronautical band, it's available worldwide. Now, it's quite a brave thing to suggest sharing with the aeronautical community. Um, but it's not completely mad. Uh, the primary use of this band is what's known as SSR, uh, Secondary Surveillance Radio, Radar. Uh, any pilots? And the audience will know it as the transponder or squawk. That's where that operates. That operates at uh, 10 30. Yeah, I do believe we have lost the audio. I'm wondering if we are having internet issues, and there does seem to be internet issues. I know I've uh, dropped twice already this morning. Yeah, audio's back from my side. Uh, 